We are here today with Tom Campbell, author of My Big Toe, A Big Theory of Everything. Tom, in a previous interview, we spoke about the results of Australian National University's recent physics experiment and how it set the materialist viewpoint back to the physics of the 19th century yet again. Basically, what it says is that this is an information-based reality, not a material-based reality. You've just prepared a comprehensive set of experiments that are variations of the double slit experiment. Now, at Australian National University, this was not a double slit experiment. It was one of John Wheeler's thought experiment, which is a similar type of experiment. Uh, your variations of the double slit experiment are something new, something that may not have been tried. Can you tell us what you predict these experiments will show? Well, yes. Um, they're going to clarify some points that are still uh, uh, you know, discussed, and maybe not among quantum theorists, but probably so, but certainly among uh, others. And that is that information is the only thing that's important as far as understanding the results of these experiments. That this, the material-based idea is not relevant to the experiments. So for instance, uh, however one erases the which way information, it's erased. And when you erase that information, you're going to get a particular result. You erase that information, you'll get a diffraction pattern. And it doesn't matter how you erase it, you see. It doesn't matter whether or not uh, you just don't detect it, whether or not you detect it and don't record it, or whether you record it and then erase the recording. You see, as long as your erasure is complete, then it doesn't matter how that information gets erased. It just means that the information no longer exists here. It's no longer available uh, as objective proof or as of objective evidence that the particle went through one slit as opposed to the other. So that's one thing that we have. A lot of people evidently believe that uh, that's not the case, that it's material-based, that it depends on how you erase that information. So my first uh, or second experiment will, will uh, probe that issue. I have uh, some other erasure experiments, and I, I uh, uh, probe them in delayed form, delayed erasure. That means you erase the which way data after the uh, result has already been recorded at the screen. Okay, which means that the results have already been, recorded, been recorded at the screen before you erase. That's a delayed eraser. And the regular eraser where the result, where the which way data is, is uh, erased before the results appear at the screen. And a couple of variations of that to work out the details of, of uh, really what's going on there. I have an experiment that demonstrates whether or not the information that's required to uh, create a diffraction pattern or not, whether that has to be objective information or whether it can be subjective information. In other words, does it have to be arrived at deductively, which means a fact, not an opinion, or can it be something that's inductively reasoned, which means it's maybe highly probable, maybe even point nine 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 probable, but isn't an objective fact. So that's something I think has never been done before. Uh, I have a yet another experiment that shows that if you change the logic, you're just changing the, the logic of the way the virtual reality works. Re virtual reality works in a very specific way to create this reality. It's random draws from probability distributions. So if you do things in, in a reverse order, or do things so that you force 
probability distributions to change. So that changes the logic of the experiment. And by doing that, you get a completely different result. And I've used the delayed erasure that was done um, in year 2000. I've showed that uh, several times in my talks, that particular delayed eraser, and actually do it backwards. We do it in a reverse order, and what that is going to allow, is going to allow the people doing the experiment to predict how the particles will react when they get to a half-silvered mirror. See, with a half-silvered mirror, there's a 50-50 chance that will reflect or transmit. It will either reflect and go on one path or transmit and go on the other path. And that's just the way that material works. And it always works that way. But I'm going to set up logical conditions so that the experimenters will be able to predict exactly which way it will go when it gets to that mirror. Will it transmit or will it reflect? Now see, physically that's impossible because the physics of that mirror says that it's a 50-50 chance. I'm going to make it a zero or 100% chance so that that will be a prediction they will be able to make. So that just looks at the way that virtual reality uh, computes physical reality and by altering a logical condition you get to uh, you know you get to see the results of that. So I'm forcing the system to make that particle go a particular way at that mirror to reflect or to transmit. And by forcing it to do that, we'll see if that, uh, if that logic change actually has that effect. So that should be a very interesting experiment. So you see, some of the experiments are to verify the way virtual reality works, or the way I think virtual reality should work. Some of them are to determine whether or not the information has to be of a particular kind and type or not. And others are just to point out some, some uh, results, some facts, like only information is important. Whether you erase that information or create that information, this way or that way really doesn't matter. It's the information that matters, not the process. Uh, that will uh, that will be surprising, I think, to a lot of uh, of people who now believe that the physical process is important, not just the logical process, the information process. So I think they're going to be interesting. It's twelve experiments in all, and they probe uh, twelve different um, you know twelve different aspects of virtual reality explaining quantum mechanics. So that's really the point of the whole thing, is that quantum mechanics, we know, we know how to compute it. We know how to do the math and get the right answer. What we don't know is why it works that way. Well, virtual reality theory can explain exactly why it works that way and allow you to predict the result without doing the math. Okay? You can tell how it's going to work out if you just see the logic and the logical sequence of the problem. So that is what virtual reality brings to quantum mechanics. Instead of it being weird science, it's just science. Logical science that we can understand exactly how it works. Not weird science that works in some funny, odd way that nobody really understands. You see, as uh, the quantum theorists now say that, you know, well, that's a Feynman quote, right? That uh, nobody will ever understand, you know, how this works. Or there is no, what did he say? What were his words? There, there's no, um, there's no um, physical way to describe this. That this is just beyond our, our uh, physical understanding. Well, it's not. Once you understand virtual reality, you'll see that quantum mechanics couldn't work any other way. This is you know, just a logical process of how reality is created, and it will logically uh, explain 
the results of quantum processes, including entanglement, including tunneling, including all the quantum phenomena, not just double slit, but all the quantum phenomena will come, will be a logical process that one can say, well, here's what's going to happen. This will be the answer to that experiment without doing any math, just because you understand how it works. Well, Tom, virtual reality has gained momentum and acceptance as a theory and is showing up in many other disciplines um, other than physics. I'm finding some expert scientists with um, lots of research, highly credentialed, that are able to demonstrate within their work how reality works um, I, with an, their understanding of quantum mechanics in, in the sense mm -hmm. that you understand it, um, that this is a virtual reality, that a virtual reality must be computed outside of this reality, and that the computations are carried out in the non-physical. Yes, now, you know, Donna, mm -hmm. uh, sorry for interrupting, but no, that's uh, good. Uh, this is a very interesting thing that you bring up because of course, it's, it's my understanding that this is a virtual reality. It's not that it might be, but that it is a virtual reality because that idea makes everything else understandable. Without that idea, there's so much that we just don't understand. There's so many uh, paradoxes. So I think that it is definitely a virtual reality. And because it is, it's not surprising that scientists in lots of different fields should be running in to the nature of the reality. If they, if they dig down into it with enough detail and with enough logic, people in biology, people in uh, you know, neuroscientists, people in neurology, uh, all sorts of people ought to be, you know, people who are studying brains, ought to be running into facts of their research, of their experiments, that can't be explained any other way, that, that tell them that the physical reality just isn't an acceptable way of looking at the problem because it just doesn't work. So I'm glad to hear that you found some of these uh, uh, other people in other fields who have come to the same conclusion because I kind of expected that that would be the case. We should be uh, hearing more about that now that virtual reality is kind of a subject that scientists can talk about without being, uh, you know, uh, uh, intimidated by the majority saying, well, that's ridiculous, because now there's enough talk about virtual reality that scientists who kind of come to that conclusion privately can sort of come out now and, and uh, talk about it, that they have experiments that, uh, that indicate that the physical reality viewpoint that this is a matter, time, space reality is uh, just not so. So I'm interested in, uh, in what you found. Well, now that we have some clarity on what the results of these experiments say, we have to question those physicists and other scientists who continue to pursue the materialist viewpoint and search for consciousness in the physical contrary to the results and evidence of the physics experiments we've mentioned. Um, they search for consciousness arising from the brain, or propose that it is transported by a physical information system, or suggest a um, multiple universe theory. Whether or not they're proposed in reference to quantum mechanics, that really, really small stuff they're looking for, it's still the materialist view they're supporting, and it it still probably isn't correct. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree with that. As long as they're looking for a material cause of consciousness, they're going to be disappointed because that's not the way consciousness is. Given that this is a virtual reality, which again, the more and more data is supporting that, um, that's just not the case. And it just, that cannot be the case. All right, as I mentioned before, um, I'd like to acknowledge those scientists whose work, experiments, and experience supports the non-physical reality conclusion that these results, that these physics uh, experiments results show. And one of those is um, Dr. Bruce Grayson. Uh, he is a 
professor of psychiatry with over 100 publications in academic and medical journals, and a former director of the per perceptual studies at the University of Virginia. He states there is no known mechanism by which physical processes can produce non-physical things. He recently gave a, a talk, no it isn't recent, but he did give a talk that is out on YouTube and I was very impressed because he seems to understand very well from his years of research and publications that um, the non-physical is very much a part of this reality. Um, what he says is the, material, the materialistic understanding of the world fails to deal with how a thought or feeling is produced. Now this is coming from his particular viewpoint. And he goes on to say, and yet despite having no idea of how it could work, most neuroscientists continue to maintain this 19th century materialistic view that the brain, in some miraculous way we do not understand, produces consciousness. And they discount or ignore the evidence that consciousness in extreme circumstances can function without a brain. Now, his research in particular viewpoint is different, of course, from physicists, but it seems that he has locked into the true nature of reality through his own perspective. Yes, uh, his, when he says that uh, no physical process can produce a non-physical process, what he's talking about there, I believe, from what you said, is that thoughts and feelings are non-physical processes. Qualia that we uh, uh, perceive are results of non-physical processes. Uh, there's never been any evidence to the contrary that they are physical processes. But it is true that they correlate with physical processes. You see, it's not that there's no connection whatsoever between physical process and consciousness. There is correlations. And the reason there are correlations is because the avatar, which is what, uh, of course, they're referring to as physical, and in that virtual reality that we call our physical universe, uh, the avatar sets the constraints on what the consciousness can do. So, and, and that's, of course, according to the rule set of the virtual reality. So the rule set of the virtual reality affects what goes on in that physical, quote-unquote, virtual reality, and it also limits what consciousness can do, what consciousness has to work with. So if you have um, a damaged uh, part of your brain, say the speech center in your brain gets damaged for some reason, maybe you can't speak any longer. Well, what's happened is that that trauma that damaged the, speak, the, the speaking center is you know, virtual trauma in a virtual brain that's in a virtual body. And because that, let's say, that disease or whatever affected that brain changes the, con the constraints that consciousness has to work with. So that's what's going on. So that's the correlation. The correlation is that when the constraints change, the consciousness now has to work without speech because the rule set of it that, that, that determines what that avatar does will no longer support speech. You see? So there is a connection, or there is a correlation, but it's not causal. It's not that the physical or the brain causes consciousness, but there's a correlation such that what happens in the physical does limit what consciousness can do. You see? So that's where people get confused. They see the fact that uh, you get hit in the head with a pipe, and now it changes your consciousness. So they say, ah, the brain you know, creates consciousness, but that is a, that's poor logic. Just because there's correlations does not create causal connections. There's lots of things that can be correlated that aren't causal, you see. So, uh, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Grayson kind of makes that, that point that uh, correlations do not causality make. And, uh, that's the only reason that people think that the brain creates consciousness is they see that, cause, they see that, that relationship between them. 
and they jump to an erroneous conclusion that it's a causal relationship, that somehow the brain causes consciousness, and they do that jump because that's the way their beliefs run, that physical is the main thing and everything else is derived from the physical, so therefore consciousness must be derived from the physical. So that's kind of how that works. Now he has evidently done some research that says that that just doesn't explain the data. And that's what we expect. People will do that who do real good research. And he mentioned there that you mentioned that he said that uh, sometimes you can have consciousness without a brain. And I thought about that for a second. That was like, mm, really? But then it occurred to me what he's probably talking about. When some people have brain death, they'll die. And the brain doesn't work anymore. And the brain stops making signals. The brain is no longer functioning as a brain, and yet they can come back after being revived and tell stories about everything that happened during that period that they did not have a working brain. So obviously, consciousness isn't dependent on that brain, but it is dependent on that avatar coming back such that the consciousness can then explain, you see, what, uh, what it saw and what its perceptions were. So I think that's what he was talking to, those few cases where the, where the brain is completely non-functioning, yet the consciousness goes on to have experiences and think about those experiences and make judgments and analysis during those experiments and then come back and say, oh yeah, I was floating over top the operating table and I saw this happen and that happen and all the things and then the lady came in from that door and uh, you know somebody did this and that. And all those things then actually happened, you see. So that happens routinely in operating rooms where people find themselves floating in the operating room someplace and then they can uh, explain what went on there. Uh, and if that also happens at a time when the brain isn't functioning, well, I guess that makes a point, doesn't it? That brain isn't creating that consciousness. That is exactly what his research has uh, pointed to. Um, Another impressive thing is his reference to the beginnings of quantum mechanics in one of his talks. Um, Dr. Grayson states, physicists faced with overwhelming experimental evidence were moving away from the materialistic view of the universe to a quantum physics that cannot be formulated without reference to consciousness playing an independent role in the universe. I thought that was quite impressive or yes. in another discipline See, to recognize that. Yes, and, and the problem we have here is exactly the same one that tricks people into thinking that the brain creates consciousness because they see the correlation. The only thing that makes researchers believe that somehow quantum events, quantum you know, interactions are responsible for consciousness is that they have this correlation. The correlation that quantum physics can produce non-local events and consciousness can produce non-local events or demonstrates non-local events. So they both demonstrate non-local events and nothing else does. See, nothing else in the physical world ten tends to demonstrate non-locality. Non so the jump to conclusion is, oh, consciousness must be made through quantum interactions. You see, it's, it's quantum physics that's creating consciousness. And now they're looking for, you know, quantum interactions or in, interactions at the quantum level to explain consciousness. But again, there's a, there's a, a correlation that is not at all causal. But that conclusion is jumped to because they don't have anything else to jump to. They don't have any other ideas because they've struck out on this idea of getting consciousness out of physical matter. Ah, and then somebody said, quantum, that's non-local. Yes, and we have another impressive scientist, Dr. Donald Hoffman, who is a professor of cognitive science, the University of California, Irvine. He has a PhD in computer science from MIT, which is very interesting. He concluded after 25 years of research and empirical evidence that there is no brain. In other words, 
it's a metaphor. In his TED Talk, which I was very impressed with, Do We See Reality As It Is, he discusses your brain in relation to your conscious experience and asks, why have we made so little progress in solving this mystery? He suggests we have evolved not to see the truth. We're told the problem is too hard. In an excerpt from one of his video interviews, he asks, can we get quantum mechanics from consciousness? That would be an interesting one for you to answer. Yes, and indeed, he is working on that. What he has done is, and I'd like to know more about it, I, I did pick up that TED Talk, and I have heard that, uh, but I have not yet followed up to find out more about you know, what he's doing and how he's doing it. But I got just a glimpse from what he said, and it seems as though he's taking what he calls conscious agents and letting them interact. And through this interaction of conscious agents, he can uh, reproduce all the qualities of consciousness. And as he studies the ways that these uh, conscious agents interact, he is hopeful to be able to describe, or if you will, derive the science of quantum mechanics. And he already has, claims that his, uh, his uh, research has produced the Schrodinger wave equation. He can derive the Schrodinger wave equation, which is kind of the, the fundamental approach to uh, quantum mechanics calculations from his, um, from his study of these uh, conscious agents. So what he's doing is taking a model of consciousness and deriving physics from it. Well, that sounds familiar. <laughs> See, that's, what, uh, that's basically what my big toe is, taking a model of consciousness and deriving physics from it. So, more power to him. I hope that he uh, gets further than just Schrodinger's equation and he can do a general, um, you know, a, a general uh, proof, mathematical proof, that uh, shows that from these conscious agents he can derive physics because that would be great. We're all uh, working on the same team here because what he's, what he's doing is just working with information. He's never used the words virtual reality, but he described virtual reality quite precisely when he said, what's physical isn't really real. It's just a metaphor. It's just, uh, it's like the, um, it's like an icon on your computer screen. The icon on your computer screen is not the Word document that, you know, that it's referring to. You got an icon for Word, and that icon is not the Word document. And it's, it's not the words, it's something else. It's an interface. It's an interface we use uh, because we wouldn't want to have to deal with the ones and zeros and transistors and all the details that make up computers. So we have an interface, and he sees reality as this interface. Well, that's just, to me, another way of describing this as a virtual reality. The reality is not what we think it is as far as the mass, you know, the matter, the, the things. It's not materialistic at all. It's an interface, a non-physical interface. Well, a non-physical interface is a virtual reality. If it's non-physical, we're talking about a computed virtual reality. So, yeah, he's right on. He's right on the target with that, uh, though he hasn't actually made the connection yet to virtual reality. Well, if he has, I shouldn't say he hasn't made the connection, but he didn't mention in his TED Talk that he had made that connection with virtual reality, but his description is one of a virtual reality. So yes, that's very interesting and uh, a very welcome uh, piece of research, and it's, and it's very ambitious that he's trying to derive physics physics equations directly from his conscious agents. Yes, um, I really liked his, it's that there's no brain kind of statement. Yeah, well that was a, that was a dramatic that was, statement that, was, that he that made. You know, when you, you do a TED talk, you got to say yeah, things that are punchy. Good. And when he looked at the audience and says, and this is, this is a kicker, or this is the big one or something, he says, you know what that means? There is no brain. <laughs> 
Now, where what he was saying is there is no physical brain because the yeah. physical reality is virtual. That was, that was a translation of that. There is no physical reality, therefore there is no physical body, therefore there is no physical brain. You see, it's all done in consciousness and that's, that's the right idea. It is interesting and what is also impressive too is that in this, uh, I'm taking this particular um, quote from a discussion from Quora um, he states quantum mechanics. Here's another mention of quantum mechanics by another scientist in another discipline. I think it's very interesting. Quantum mechanics says that classical objects, including brains, don't exist. So this is a far more radical claim about the nature of reality and does not involve the brain pulling off some tricky quantum computation. So even Penrose hasn't taken it far, far enough, and that's in that he's referring to uh, some studies that uh, Roger Penrose is involved with. But most of us, you know, we're born realists. We're born physicalists. This is a really, really hard one to let go of. Of course, that's always what you have said. Yes, of course, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that is an interesting comment, of course, but it's what we, we, I guess we discussed that a little bit, and that is that, sure, Quantum mechanics, double slit experiment, all of those things have 80 some years ago, 87, 88, almost 90 years ago, uh, have shown that the materialist view is just wrong and that consciousness is connected. The observer has to make a measurement before we end up with a physical particle, according to quantum mechanics. So knowing all that, though, because we didn't know what the next step was, we've kind of let that go and gone on trying to continue to prove that the consciousness is somehow created out of physical process. And scientists who were born and raised and bred and educated with the belief that physical reality is fundamental just have a hard time giving that up and going in a different direction. So in their minds, they're waiting for some other explanation to come along that fixes everything and makes it physical again. Of course, that's not going to happen. The reality is we keep going further and further away from that result. So Tom, in addition to these scientists, this is just a couple of examples of other disciplines, scientists in other disciplines, and I mean serious credential uh, published, uh, highly uh, regarded scientists who have come to these conclusions that, you know, this is a virtual reality and interestingly enough how they have understood quantum mechanics being from these other disciplines which physicists seem to have a, a more difficult time with. Uh, there are thousands of them. You know, we can name um, of course, Edward Fredkin now is a, a digital philosopher. He was always known as a proponent of virtual reality and as saying that the virtual reality is computed in other. These two expert scientists are just a few of the thousands of scientists who have found that this is a virtual reality. Um, Edward Fredkin, of course, is, in, is a physicist, a digital philosopher. In rebooting the cosmos, are we living in a computer simula simulation? He said, once we discover the rule, anyone will be able to understand it. It will be simple. And you've always said that the rule is simple. Yes. Can you just... Yes, actually, the whole concept of virtual reality is simple. It's not so hard. The only thing that makes it difficult for people is because it is so contrary to what they have believed all of their lives. That's what makes it hard. Once you look at virtual reality uh, process and kind of the rules and the, and the logic of virtual reality, it is a very simple, straightforward process. It's not difficult at all. It's, um, you know, it's very elegant. And the reason that Fredkin and others have, have said that this is 
once we understand it, you know, there's some understanding out there that we don't have that'll make this all make sense. And once we get that, it's going to be really simple. It's not going to be complex. It's not going to come with 10 pages of math behind it. It's going to be a concept, an idea. And once we get that, it'll be, oh, gee, why didn't I think of that? It's going to be simple. And that matches very well with the general philosophy of science, which says that so far what we have seen as science has become more and more uh, complex and complicated, we go back in history of science and we see that all the big ideas, all the ideas that were, you know, paradigm changing, that really made science stop and take a right turn or a left turn or, you know, work on other problems, that, that kind of paradigm changing ideas, they were all simple ideas. They weren't big complex ideas. The, if you get to things that are fundamental, they tend to be elegant and simple and not that hard to understand. Now you can take things that aren't fundamental, things that are logical derivatives of these simple ideas, and they can get very, very complex. But the fundamental ideas themselves are very simple. You know, even back in Newton's time, where he was not entirely correct, but he was close enough in a particular area where the velocities aren't too fast and the things aren't too small and so on in that area, or things aren't really all that big either. In that kind of um, everyday macro area, he had just a few laws, a few big, simple ideas. No two points can occupy the same space. Things travel in a straight line unless acted on by an external force and so on. They're called Newton's laws. Well, they turned out they weren't right. They weren't laws at all. But in that area, they worked. But still, though you can do Newtonian physics, can, get very, can be very complicated, solving very complex problems, trying to solve a, a three-body problem or an n-body problem in physics, which means how things interact with each other uh, gravitationally, uh, is a very, very difficult problem, hugely complicated. But the fundamentals of that physics are simple just a few statements that are clear to anybody, whether you've ever learned math or not, whether you know anything about physics or not, they're obvious to everyone. And that's the way our science has always grown. The big ideas, the fundamental ideas, are always simple and straightforward. The problem we have is they're outside of our reality. They're outside of our viewpoint. They're beyond what we believe. And we're, we grow up with these beliefs. We get them out of our culture and out of our schools and so on. And we just can't see that simple thing sitting right in front of us because that's not the way the world works. You see, that's the problem. It's, it's being in a belief trap is the, uh, is the issue there. And all of these scientists you're talking about are people that uh, are out-of-the-box thinkers, people who have dared to go where, where you know, no scientists have gone before and stand up with the courage to say, you know, there is no brain. Well, you know, if you did that 10 years ago, everybody would have laughed and catcalled and said, yeah, well, obviously you don't have one, you know, that kind of thing. Nobody would take it seriously, but now, 2016, you can say those things and everybody listens because that's where science is going, because that's the way reality works. And we're going to get there one way or another, but uh, we've got a lot of people in belief traps that we're going to have to, to um, coax into seeing a bigger picture. And they will, eventually. Well, yes, that, that brings me to the conclusion of our, of our interview. It's really, um, now your big toe, big theory of everything, you've logically derived relativity and quantum mechanics 
from beginning with consciousness. So how that and it is still science because it's all logically derived. Mm. Um, yeah, it'd probably be more accurate to say, not so much that I derived them, in a way that's true, but I've derived the basic understanding of why they are the way they are. With relativity, the key idea in relativity is that the speed of light's a constant. And if that weren't the fact, then most of what we know about relativity would just disappear. You see, most of relativity is based upon that as a being a fact, but nobody knows why that should be that way. Why should the speed of light be a constant? And of course, virtual reality tells you why it should be a constant. It comes out as a perfectly obvious conclusion. It must be a constant. And with quantum mechanics, you know, what I derive, again, is the why. Why should particles be best described as probability distributions? Why? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Particles are particles, right? Newton reigns supreme. Uh, particles uh, shouldn't be described. You shouldn't have to describe particles as probability distributions in order to compute what they actually do. You see, and that's what quantum mechanics has been. So they've had this big mystery that they just take as an assumption, just like we just take as assumption that, well, C is a constant, even if we don't know why. And then we go ahead and do the math. After that, we get right answers. But that's what my virtual reality does. It makes those unknowns, those paradoxes, those, wow, you know, why is it like that? doesn't make any sense. Well, if you look at it from a virtual reality perspective, it does make sense. It not, in, not only makes sense, but it couldn't be any other way. It says, this is the way it works. It couldn't work any other way. So that's, the, that's kind of the, you know, what the virtual reality will do. Once we get over our belief trap of knowing, thinking that everything is physical, once we let that go, it just isn't that hard to see a different viewpoint that explains all these unexplainable things and explains all the explainable things too. It explains everything. It's not like a theory that, well, it'll explain this, but it makes something else harder to explain. It explains everything. That's why it's a toe, because virtual reality explains it all. It explains the connections between things. I guess it would have been more accurate for me to say you, you've bridged quantum mechanics and yes. relativity. Uh, because you stepped outside of this paradigm into the paradigm that the results yeah. of the experiments have said where our true reality lies. Exactly. See, the virtual reality, when you understand that, you understand the superset. It's not that you have quantum mechanics over here and relativity over there, but you've got something that is above both of those, logically, above both of those, from which they're both derived. So that's the overarching concept that allows you to understand everything else. And the neat thing is that it not only allows you to understand physics, quantum mechanics and relativity, but it also gives you a very simple and accurate model of consciousness. You see? And with consciousness comes all of the metaphysics. And with all of that comes the things that we call paranormal because we can't give them a normal, which means physical, explanation. Well, it's because they're not physical based. They're consciousness based. But once you understand consciousness, then the possibilities of all these things become obvious. And it's simple. We could call quantum mechanics paranormal for that matter because you can't normally, with material science, explain quantum mechanics. So we'll say, Quantum mechanics is a paranormal science. Yeah, well, of course, everybody would laugh at that, but if you want to, you know, if you want to uh, and put those definitions and, and uh, let, them, uh, let them work where they apply, it's paranormal if there is no physical answer. If there is no physical reason why it should be this way, then it's paranormal. Para means it's outside of normal, beyond normal. So, so is quantum mechanics paranormal. It's been paranormal ever since the 1920s. And when uh, Feynman says, nobody will ever understand this from a physical viewpoint, when he says, shut up and calculate, 
He's basically admitting that it's paranormal. But he would never use that word because we know paranormal is woo-woo and only people who have mental defects, you know, uh, think any of that exists because there's no physical cause. Well, there's no physical cause for much of what quantum mechanics says. There's no physical cause for entanglement, you see. It happens. It happens and it's real and it's a part of our reality, but there is no, and by what I mean physical, not that quote physical unquote that really means something else, but there is no material Newtonian, you know, material world cause for those things. There's, uh, the cause is wrapped up in particles aren't really particles, they're probability distributions, you see. Well, now you've just stepped out of the physical description into a non-physical math. Probability distributions are not physical things in the physical world. They're math. They're abstract ideas. They're not chunks. You can't weigh a probability distribution and say, well, how much does this weigh? How much volume does that probability distribution take up? Where does it sit? How much space does, you know, how much space does it consume? How much does it weigh? All the normal things that, that define something being physical. So you've got these particles aren't really physical at all. They're abstract ideas. They're probability distributions. What's that all about? I think you got a paranormal science there. <laughs> I'm just being humorous here, but uh, well. that it, if the shoe fits, wear it. Well, you're you're my big toe. Or grand, it's a grand unified theory, really. There is no such thing as paranormal. When you unify everything, the norm, paranormal uh, becomes normal. Yeah, everything's normal. That's all. This is normal. Once you understand it all, you don't say, well, you have this set of things that must be nuts and that couldn't be real because they're not material-based. Well, <laughs> neither is science material-based these days, and neither is uh, evidently neuroscience because we have uh, Hoffman coming out of neuroscience saying this material world is a fiction. And uh, we have that coming out of lots of scientists, and we have, what was the other fellow's name? Grayson. We have Dr. Grayson saying the same thing. This material worldview is a fiction. It doesn't work like that. The science says this is not right. And then, of course, now you have thousands of physicists who agree with that. Virtual reality is the, the latest big thing in science. And the reason it's a big thing is not because it's a fad, it's because it's better physics. It, it describes the world that we measure and understand better than materialism. That's why there's thousands of physicists who think that virtual reality is a good idea. But most of those physicists haven't gone very far with it. They just know it's not material and it's information based. And they've not taken any more steps than that. They're kind of that far. But these things take time. It takes time for a, a, somebody that's a true believer to work their way out of a belief. It's not something that's done quickly. Well, Dr. Grayson had a question posed to him. Why is there this relentless resistance uh, to this new paradigm, the paradigm you're speaking of, the non-physical? There are thousands of scientists whose work confirms everything you say in your big toe, that this is a uh, reality that is non part physical and part non-physical, and the true nature of our reality also includes that non-physical, which is why your big toe includes that too. But as far as the materialists who have put in years and years of research and, and good work, uh, on a professional level, what could these materialists do? Where could they go? Could they take their unique perspective and go there and bring it to a new paradigm. How would you advise yes. that? Well, whenever you're in a time of great change, and by change I mean major paradigm shift, major shift in the way we understand how the world works. And when we've, we've gone through these time and time again, you know, we, we talk about when, when we thought the earth was the center of the universe, 
And then we thought that the, uh, you know, the world was, was flat and not round. And then we thought that you know, the Earth was at least the center of the solar system, if not the universe, and so on. We've, we've had these major paradigm shifts uh, happen to us before. And what happens is that you have a majority of people who are believers in the old paradigm. And their life is based on that. Their careers are based on that. Their structure in their world is based on that. The way they do business, uh, how much money they make, uh, their jobs, their status in the community is all based on that because that's been a belief for a very long time. And anything that's been a major belief for a very long time, you know, you draw, it creates a lot of uh, dependence on that belief because you've just grown up knowing that you know this old paradigm is the way real reality is well then the new paradigm comes there's going to be resistance there's going to be a dogged you know desire to not change change is always traumatic but the way it works out is the change happens anyway because the new paradigm is a better way of seeing reality. It's more efficient, you know, it covers more facts. You know, you can do a whole lot more in reality if you understand that the Earth is round and not flat. You can do more if you understand that we're part of a solar system, we're not the center of the universe or the solar system or anything else, you see. Once you disabuse yourself of those ideas, then life becomes simpler. Instead of dis defining orbits like they used to with little epicycles. All these little orbits had all these little epicycles that, that were uh, necessary. Well, they were necessary because they had the view of the Earth being at the center and the sun and everything else going around it. So they had to create this very complex description. When you get a better idea, then all that complexity drops away and now you can describe things much more simply. You see, much more correctly. Well, maybe I should have just left it at much more simply. You can describe that from any point in the universe. You can describe the rest of the universe from that point. Um, so, well, how does that apply to this? And what did people do then? Well, what happens is that paradigm shift used to take a long time. The shift would occur over many years, many decades from the first ideas the coming out to the finally almost everybody agrees with the new paradigm would take a century. You know, we had Greeks who knew the world was round 200 years before that became common knowledge. <laughs> That's two centuries, you see, for these ideas to percolate and slowly people change their mind because the evidence keeps coming in and coming in and so on. So that's what we're going to do now, except now we're on internet time. We're not going to take two centuries. You see, we're going to do it a whole lot faster than that because the pace of change is much, much faster than it used to be and communications are so much better. So we're not going to take all that long, but we're still going to see the same effects. The majority of people dragging their feet, not wanting to go there, clinging to the old paradigm, and wanting to prove that the old paradigm is really right after all. You'll have a lot of people that will just won't let that go. But what happens is that eventually people reorient their careers, reorient their viewpoint, and start working on problems and ideas and things that do have a future and that are beneficial because they've now got the better paradigm. They got a new paradigm. So let's say you're an, a flat earth person and uh, you have this paradigm that the earth is flat and you really resist it and you resist it. Well, what you need to do is to go become a shipper, shipping things, you know, around the world, right? Because the world's round and you can buy goods here and go east and deliver them there and keep going east and pick up new ones and keep going east and pretty soon you're back to the other side and you can make this into a business because it's a whole lot more efficient that way with an understanding that's bigger 
A bigger understanding opens up more opportunities. There's more choices. There's more things that can be done with your better paradigm. That's why it's a better paradigm. If there weren't more things that could be done with it, it'd be a worse paradigm. So it's more functional. So what we do slowly is that people will stop trying to prove that physical things like the brain create consciousness. Right? They're banging their heads against the wall. And their last ditch is, oh, it must be quantum effects, because quantum effects are non-local, and so is consciousness. Well, that's a correlation, but it's not causal. So they're going to keep doing that, keep searching for ways to cling to their beliefs, but eventually they will see that where the profit is, where the advantage is, what's really going to help them professionally and in their careers is to start working on problems in the new paradigm. All right, the world's round. Well, now, how can I take advantage of that? How can I use that? How can I study that? How can I do research that verifies that? You know, they start working with it rather than denying it. That's what they'll do. So you will see people that now are trying to prove that the brain creates consciousness. There's lots of room for them working on aspects of virtual reality. See, the virtual reality is now just this big idea. It's fundamental. But there's going to be a million different ways to apply that to everyday life, to use it, you see, to, to capitalize on it that we're not ever, we've never thought about. You see, it's like when the world got round to people and suddenly they had these ideas of travel and of, of you know, trading and a lot of other things that built up a whole industry, you know, created whole cultures based on that that were never possible before. So it just is a, it's a, it opens up opportunities. Instead of banging your head against that wall of creating consciousness out of physical process, and that's true whether that's quantum mechanical physical process or any other physical process, once you, you let that go, you can start working on more interesting, more productive problems that have to do with applications of virtual reality in whatever fields you're in. What does that mean? What's the implications? Obviously, there's implica implications of that to a neuroscientist. Obviously, there's implications of that to psychiatrists, right? There's implications of that to lots of different professions. Lots of applications, you know, uh, implications to physicists, obviously. And there's going to be implications to biologists and everybody else. So eventually, people will let go of what doesn't work. And when they see other people are actually getting ahead and making progress by working with what does work, you know, with the better, the newer paradigm, then they'll turn around too. But it's not going to be quick. You don't change a believer's mind on a dime. It takes time. Yes, there's facts that say, look, here's the facts. Why can't you just see these facts and move on to the new paradigm? It doesn't work like that. Facts don't trump belief. Belief trumps everything else. Believers just ignore facts. And they say, well, they sort of look like facts, but I don't believe they're really facts. Someday we'll understand why those things, you know, work the way they do under the old paradigm. And they, that's just called denial. And that is just natural. People don't like change. Change requires us to retool ourselves, to go re-educate ourselves, to learn new things. And we tend to be set in our ways and like everything to stay just the way it is because we're very comfy, thank you, just the way we are. We're very successful here just the way we are. We don't want to get into that new idea. But it'll happen anyway. It just takes time. So we're headed there. And the more scientists that you, like you've brought up that see this and go to it, and it, okay, uh, Hoffman never used the word virtual reality, but he described the virtual reality perfectly. He just used different metaphors. He said, oh, it's like an icon on your desktop. Well, that's a virtual representation of that Word document, that icon. It's a, that's a virtual thing, you see. It's informational. It's not physical. So that's, that's why. He asked that question, why are people so hard over on denying the results of this research? Because I'm sure Dr. Grayson has delivered this, and he gets a lot of pushback from it. Well, that's impossible. That can't be like that. 
you've obviously made mistakes, you know, this sort of thing. That's like they told the people at Pear Labs, oh, you must have been making a lot of mistakes. Yeah, that doesn't, it's not like that. So when you get that pushback and it's, but, but here are the facts and people just don't seem to accept that. Well, that's the way it's going to be a while, but that will progressively get less and less that way. And more and more people will come to see the better way of doing things and a better way of understanding things. And then eventually everybody will snicker at the old paradigm. They go, those people used to think the world was flat. You know, those people used to think we were at the center of the universe. Boy, they sure were off base. And maybe 20, 30 years from now, that's the way we'll feel about people who thought that this was a materialistic reality and that there was no such thing as the non-physical. And that consciousness didn't have to be in a reality frame, as Fred, Fred can put it, in other. Other being anywhere but in this physical universe. It has to be non-physical someplace else. And they'll look at that and they'll say, well, that's so obvious. I don't understand why it took people so long to figure that out. You know, uh, wow. Well, the, um, Dr. Grayson was affiliated with the Perceptual Studies Division at the University of Virginia, and that's been going for 50 years. And they are dedicated to the non-materialist viewpoint, as their research has shown. Well, yes, so, that's, that's the thing. You know, the, the, the scientists have never been able to make a, a connection between qualia, perception, you know, the things that they've studied, and physical process. So there they are in a science that must certainly be physical based, a physical process, because everything is, and all of their research for 50 years says, eh, no link, can't find it, doesn't exist. Maybe we need some different ideas. So they start looking at different ideas, and yeah, that fits, and this fits. So it's not surprising that out of that kind of research, you end up with people who are convinced that this is a virtual reality because they, the opposite idea that it's a material reality just doesn't work for them. It doesn't, it doesn't answer their questions. Not only convinced, but uh, have quite a good grasp of quantum mechanics. Um, <laughs> what quantum mechanics are, can't do yeah. as well as what it can do. Exactly. Yeah, quantum mechanics isn't going to somehow create consciousness out of, out of uh, quantum uh, interactions of physical particles. It's like that's not the way the world works. It's just not that way. You know, you can't, you can't take a spherical earth and iron it flat as much as you'd like to. You know, it's just not a process that's going to work. You have, it's just the wrong idea. It's, it's, a, it's an old paradigm that worked for a long time about this physical. You know, from Newton on, it's, well, long before Newton. This physical paradigm has been the way we view reality. And it's just run its course. And now we are clever enough and have enough sophisticated research that we see that it doesn't, it doesn't hold anymore. It isn't the way we thought it was. It's different. We've had double slit telling us that since the 1920s, probably since before the 1920s, but it got public in the 1920s. And uh, we're still clinging to uh, the materialist viewpoint in, in science, by and large. But it is changing. So see, we're almost a century from when we had facts that said this is, material view is wrong. We had inconvertible and undeniable facts almost a century ago, just like the Greeks 200 years before the rest of the world said, you know, that, uh, that the world is a, is a sphere and you can go around, you can keep traveling east and get back to where you started. For 200 years, that was denied because it didn't make sense. So we've had almost 100 years now of denying that the reality is not physical. It's, it's going faster now. We won't have another 100 years. We'll, we'll do better than that. Maybe, maybe a decade now. Well, we'll, we'll, you, we'll get there. You're thank welcome, Don. It's been fun you. as always. Thank you so much. And I would like to mention that your 12 physics experiments will be available to view in a few months. And if any physics labs out there would like to give it a try and put another nail in the coffin of materialist <laughs> viewpoint, 
You're welcome to do that. Yes, we'd like that. We have made a first pass on doing the voicing and the recording of those. Uh, we've made a video where we've gone through at least some of the material. And there's some yet to be, to be uh, put into, into uh, video. But the video that we're making is not really like any of the other videos we made. This, this video isn't really a presentation of the material. It's not like something that I could stand up and present to an audience, you know, with view graphs. Yes, it's on view graphs, the data's on that, but it really isn't made to be presented. It's made to be read because I expect that there will be lots of people, since we're making this for physicists to go out and do these experiments, that's why we're making it. So physicists will do the experiments and give us some uh, experimental evidence that what I'm saying is right or wrong, or you know, that the ideas work, and if so, where are they wrong and why? I mean, that's the way theories work. If you prove something wrong, well, that's great because that enables you to make it better, you see? So we, we need to get this, this information in. So what I've done is, is I've made them such that the slides themselves contain all the information necessary to understand the experiments and what's going on. So it doesn't really require any listening to Tom Campbell talk because I know scientists well enough, they'll take it, they'll throw away all the talk, they'll look at the experiments. That's the way they're going to work. They don't need to listen to some guy talk about virtual reality to prove that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He'll just, they'll just do the experiment, you see? So I have those slides are just loaded with words. They're not 20 point type, which is what you need to show on a view graph. They're 12 point type or even 10 point type because I'm squeezing information in on a slide. So it's not something to really view like a movie and, and see, it's, it's basically made to be read slide by slide and we're hoping that then we're making the slides available and we're going to make a DVD of this available so that people who really are interested in understanding this presentation, understanding this, uh, th these experiments, they can go get the slides, they can get the DVD, they can study it, and then hopefully they can go do the experiments. And if you're not going to do experiments, but you just want to understand it and follow it along, then you can get the slides and you can, you can also get a DVD if you like and understand it. But don't expect it to be like a normal presentation. It's not. It's very information intensive. Everything is written out so that it won't be misunderstood. It won't, uh, I won't say one thing and somebody else will take it to mean something else. So there's lots and lots of words written on these slides, not to be presented, but to be read. So that's, that's what's coming. Thanks, Tom. And I hope people will take up this challenge to produce those physics experiments for you and return some feedback. I hope so. I'm really looking forward to the results because of the way I look at it, it's a win-win. Whatever those experiments turn out to show, we will learn from it. If they corroborate what I have been saying, that's great. We'll just march on. If they don't, if they, if they show that what I'm saying is flawed in some way, that's great too. That enables us to modify and change and, and uh, see where our mistake was and do better. So it's a win. That's the way science works. You do the experiment, not with the idea that you want it to be a certain way, but the idea that that experiment will show you what's truth. Now they need to be done very well and conscientiously by people who are open-minded and, and really doing the experiment. If they're done by people who know what the result is, then they're liable to not do good experiments. They're liable to cut corners and do other things because they already know the result and that may not work too well. So I'm looking forward to having these done multiple places by multiple people. So if we have four or five sets of people in different institutions doing these experiments and they all get the same answers, that's really credible. If just one person does them, eh, that's good. It's indicative of something, but it'd be nice if we get multiple people to do these experiments because then the evidence is, is really firm. 
I'm in favor of Australian National University Physics <laughs> Department because, doing these experiments. Yeah, because they did the one, uh, yes. yeah. Well, the reason they did that one of uh, Wheeler, what is it, John Archibald Wheeler, they did that because they could, because they figured out the way to actually perform the experiment. Because Wheeler said it decades ago, but there was no way to actually do the experiment until the clever people in Australia figured out how to actually do the experiment. So their, uh, their genius in that was to figure out the mechanics of doing it. Now these experiments that I have are simple double slit experiments. They're not things that are expensive, they're not hard to do. The hardest one to do is the one that was done in 2000. Well, that one's already been done. Papers are written on it, so all the techniques and everything are available. Even the people that did it are still around to, you know, to call up and ask detailed questions. So none of them are that hard. None of them are that expensive. So I'm hoping that, uh, yeah, I think the uh, Aussies would do real well to do that, that uh, since they had that uh, big win. These they wouldn't find very difficult as far as the mechanics of actually doing the experiment. But the results, I think, are likely to be dramatic, earth-shaking even, paradigm-changing. But let's see. That's my prediction, but uh, I could be wrong. But in either case, I'm going to be really glad to find out.